that's what I love about influencers is that, you know, you could just be the quote unquote regular person, but just influencing people by just being yourself. And that's to me what an influencer is. Hey, my name is Jenna Kutcher, and I am obsessed with all things business, marketing numbers, and helping you to navigate both the messy and the magical seasons of this thing called life. I'm a small town mama who took a $300 camera, grew a successful photo biz, and now I work from home and run a seven figure online business. I teach you the tried and true secrets to building a career you adore. Shy away from the real talk? <laughs> no way. Money, hardship, growth, loss, and marketing are all topics we discuss here. Think of this as your one stop shop for happy hour with a gal pal mixed with business school. Pull up a seat, make sure you're cozy, and get ready to be challenged and encouraged while you learn. This is the Gold Digger Podcast. It's wild to think that less than a decade ago, the field of influencer marketing was just blooming into the powerhouse that it is today. No matter where you look on social media, content creators are using their platforms to serve their audiences with the clothing, skincare, gadgets, foods, and other goods that they love. And brands, well, they're seeing the true power of an influencer with a strong voice and a dedicated following. Risa Girona was one of the first brand side leaders of the influencer marketing movement, pitching her idea for an influencer trip to her new employer, Revolve, as a way for them to build buzz and engagement in sales through social media. The idea was a runaway hit, and now influencers are a key element of Revolve's marketing strategy. I am so excited to hear from Raisa about this growing and ever-changing space. In this conversation, you'll learn about the evolution of influencer marketing, advice for starting and growing your own business as an influencer, as well as how to leverage the power of this unique type of marketing for your own products. Are you ready to dive on in? Let's do it. I've been taking tons of walks with Baby Quinn lately, and it's always a great time for podcasts. Thankfully, I've got a ton of new shows to listen to from the HubSpot Podcast Network, just like My First Million, hosted by Sam Parr and Sean Purry. My First Million features famous guests, digs into how companies made their first million, and brainstorms new business ideas based on the hottest trends and opportunities in the marketplace. They've covered topics like why the next big social media network will be on the blockchain, companies of one that make millions, and three patterns for great business ideas. Listen to My First Million and all the HubSpot Podcast Network shows wherever you get your podcasts. Raisa, welcome to the Gold Digger Podcast. I have to tell you, you were on my dream guest list after we did a Zoom call with our friend Lori Harder. We're both investors in her product. And just getting to see you on a screen, I was like, one, I want to be her friend. Two, I want her to come on the show. So thank you so much for coming on the Gold Digger Podcast. I'm so, so, so happy to be here. Thank you so much for thinking of me and for having me. And honestly, I felt the exact same way on that Zoom call. I was like, who is this woman who I think also were breastfeeding yes. on part of the call? <laughs> and yes, yeah, so I just, I'm so grateful and I'm so excited to be on here with you and just get to know you more, hopefully for the next coming years to come. Yes. Okay. So tell me, I'm so curious because what you're doing today, which we will dive into is just so amazing and fascinating to me, but tell me a little bit about where your story began. Like, how did you get to where you are today? And then where are you today? (laughs) Well, today I'm in LA. (laughs) This is where I live. But let's see how I got here today is honestly, just a lot of guessing and figuring things out and a lot of mistakes along the way. I had a clothing brand, you know, very, very long ago. And that was kind of, you know, my first foray into being an entrepreneur and trying to figure things out. And I think we all are, especially when you're an entrepreneur and starting your own business. So I launched a company in 2008. And obviously, we all know immediately after the recession hit. And so I wasn't able to deliver the clothes to the retailers that I was selling to. But lucky enough, that's how I was able to meet Revolve. They were one of the very few customers who took a chance on me as a small brand. And that's how I met Michael Mente, who is a co-founder and co-CEO of Revolve. And when I had to close my business because I ran out of money, he offered me the op- like truly an opportunity of a lifetime to start a new clothing brand with him where he would fund the entire business and I would have to run everything. 
And that brand was called Lovers and Friends, and it's still around today. And that was such a, again, golden ticket for me to not only have a second chance, but truly prove my value and learn even more and build off of what I did from my first brand. So I literally did everything from design to tech packs to figuring out manufacturing to shipping boxes and invoicing them to going to showrooms and selling the collection to marketing, which is, you know, where I ultimately am now is doing marketing. I started to reach out to bloggers back in like 08, 09, and just started, you know, sending them clothes. And that's really, you know, kind of the start of what I guess I've really grown up to be. And it's just such a special story and special journey because, you know, I didn't go to business school. I didn't go to design school or anything like this. And it was really just a lot of trial and error and people believing in me. And I guess ultimately me believing in me. That's so incredible. I want to know, Raisa, did you have any feelings of quote failure, even though your own label and what that dream was, wasn't a failure and it led to this beautiful opportunity. But how did you kind of overcome the death of that dream before you wandered into the next one? You know, that's such a good question, Jenna, because I, you know, I think a few things. One, I was much younger. I was, I think maybe like 25 at that time, 24, 25. And for some weird reason, I think just having, you know, no big responsibilities, like I didn't have a kid, I, you know, didn't have a house or anything like this. And, you know, my only debt really was like my college, you know, kind of loan. I just had more, just wanted to do more and didn't, honestly have that much fear, you know, like obviously it was Mm -hmm. devastating to, to fail, but I also was able to pick myself back up because I do think again, not having social media, like Instagram Mm -hmm. and all these things didn't really exist. So it was hard for me to, you know, compare myself to other people. I was kind of just like, you know what, this is what happened. And, you know, it's unfortunate, but then I have this other opportunity. So how do I kind of make sure that I keep going. But when I think back, I think those kind of factors of just, again, not having a ton of responsibility in the sense of you know financial responsibility, having just way less fear and no social media to just, again, compare myself, I think really helped in picking myself back up and moving on. Oh, I love that. I think the social media part is so key too. I feel like so many people these days are afraid to be a beginner or to like stand at the starting line, especially because we share so much of our lives these days that it almost feels like this public proclamation of like, I don't know what I'm doing. And I feel like part of that problem is that we all like to show up feeling like we've already overcame or we've already made it or we've already figured it out or we want to be the after version of the before and after. And I think that that is a really key thing. But I also think too, that in that response, Raisa, you almost are giving people permission to you don't have to share everything online. (laughs) No, you don't have to share everything. And I also think like, you know, what you said is right. It's like everybody wants to after Uh, and you forget that the journey through the whole thing is honestly like what feels, you know, now, you know, almost 20 years doing this feels the most satisfying is that like, I can look back and say, oh my gosh, like I've made so many mistakes and like, it was really, really hard. And like, you know, I didn't really, I had no idea how to raise money, you know, before I didn't know what like, you know, series A and any of these things was like, I didn't even know what I didn't know the, how I got my money from my first business was, you know, through, you know, my parents and, you know, kind of friends and family. And it was like $50,000, you know, like now when people are like, you know, we're raising series A at like 5 million. I'm like, whoa, like <laughs> it's, it's just like a totally different ball game. But that also creates a lot more pressure for young mm-hmm. entrepreneurs. I feel for them. And that's why I also, you know, try to tell people that are starting out and you know, entrepreneurs and even college kids to, you know, slow down a little bit and go through the before and know that yeah. like, you know, if it's, you know, it's so cheesy, but it's like, if it is meant to be, and you do put in the work, you'll eventually get there, but it's not going to happen overnight. And that's something that I, like, I don't really have ever believed in is like this concept of like overnight success. I've just never seen it. And if I have, it's not sustainable and it just doesn't last. Yes. Oh my goodness. One of the biggest questions that we get asked on this podcast and I get asked it on social is like, I really want this opportunity how do I pitch myself for it? Like, what does a pitch look like? What makes you pay attention? 
tell me about your pitch to Revolve that changed everything to you. Like, let me hear it. I want to know what this is like. (laughs) Yeah, sure. So after when we launched Lovers and Friends, we ultimately ended up launching two other brands. And in 2014, Revolve officially acquired that side company that Michael and I started. And that's how I got into the Revolve you know, family and the and, and the revolved world in that sense. And, you know, to be honest, I I didn't pitch to be in marketing. Mike and Michael, Mike being the other co-founder and co-CEO, they were like, you know what? You're like okay at designing, but I think we're you're better at marketing. And I was like so upset about it. Because <laughs> of course like designing is like feels like the most like glamorous job. But now I get in and looking back, I'm like, oh my God, I'm so was not a designer. But they were like, you know, you should try this. And I had so much hesitation for the exact same reasons I've had basically before. Like being a designer, trying to do all these things, you know, you just never know if you're gonna be good at it until you know, you actually try it and you can, you know, see if you are or not. But the fact that these people were telling me that they believed in me and that they thought that what I did at Lovers and Friends with, you know, the, you know, again, back then they were called bloggers, the blogger outreach and, you know, these types of things would, you know, potentially work for Revolve. You know, it was a really, really big leap for me because again, I never thought I'd be in marketing. But the fact that they believed in me, I just kind of went for it. My big pitch came probably, you know, six months into the, you know, quote unquote, new job. And that's when I pitched Revolve Around the World. And at that point, we were working with a lot of bloggers. Instagram had already launched and it was still fairly new, I would say, you know, sub two years. So it was very, very fresh. I mean, very, you know, similar to how we see TikTok now and how the rise of, you know, the new influencers on that platform is just absolutely astonishing and fascinating to me. But the pitch was, you know, I created a deck and back then again, I wasn't really good at decks and, you know, just presented this concept of traveling and that I wanted to be able to take these influencers out to a place where it felt really fun and aspirational and where they can take our products that we sold on Revolve and put it against a backdrop that was the most authentic and the most natural and then publish it on a platform called Instagram. You know, this concept to me, to be honest, didn't feel at that point, like revolutionary, and it still doesn't because how I viewed it was like, you know, when you travel with your parents, like back then, like you guys would go to Disneyland or go to like, you know, you know, your, your annual like family trip, like your mom would always come back and like print out all the photos and then put it in a frame in your living room. Like, so this concept of traveling and sharing, you know, memories and then making sure you remember those memories is truly something that we've done like forever. And so it's just a platform that changed, which is again, Instagram. And so, you know, the pitch of course was funny because they were like, wait, so you want us to tell you, so you're just going to travel and you're okay. You're going to take pictures. Okay. But you know, they agreed the budget was incredibly small and funny enough, we went to Arizona on our first trip. Yes. <laughs> yes we went to Sedona, Arizona, and I brought Kiara Faragni of the blonde salad. And again, this was so many years ago. And sincerely, Jules of Julie Sarinana of Sincerely Jules. And it was just us and somebody else on my team. And, you know, we went for a weekend and we immediately saw, I mean, again, it was, you know, Instagram was so new, the amount of new followers that we got and just the engagement. And that was kind of like the beginning of Revolve Around the World. And, and we've really been traveling since, you know, actually that was in 2013, since 2013. Wow. Oh my gosh. I love that. And I love remembering those early days where nowadays you're like, oh, duh, like that is what you would do. But really, that was like a trailblazing idea. And also something that brands necessarily didn't understand the value of at the time, which is almost like things have been flipped on its head. One thing that you talked about on our call with Lori that I want to talk about here is that there are a lot of people out there that want to become influencers. And there's this belief that you have to have a certain number of followers or you know hit these certain milestones in order to be coined an influencer. But you talked about how you see the needle moving massively with micro-influencers, even more so than some of the bigger accounts. 
Can we talk about that a little bit? Because yeah. I think that will give a lot of listeners permission who want to enter the space to know that like you can get results without having a certain number of followers. 1000%. I mean, we, you know, when we built this, you know, marketing playbook, we definitely started with, you know, the bigger girls, but that's only because that's who existed. I mean, it's the girls that, you know, Ami Song and, you know, Kiara Farag, I mean, these, these were, you know, fashion bloggers that ultimately, you know, own the platform for, you know, and they still do. And obviously they help kind of fuel this type of, you know, business, to be honest. And so for us, we had always worked with them. But the last couple of years, we've really seen that, you know, micro influencers are, you know, incredibly powerful in their own right for two things. One, you know, they really have this incredible engagement, especially now with Instagram being so challenging with engagement. We see that micro influencers just continue to thrive in that environment because they have that connection. You know, they're probably more easily able to answer DMs and questions and comments and such. And then they also have, you know, selling power. And so it's been, you know, for us a more dynamic dynamic ecosystem to have, you know, all types of influencers in the network that we work with. And it's, you know, whenever I get asked about this kind of plateau or maybe not, you know, non-existence of influencer marketing, you know, I, I don't believe in that. I think, again, there's so many types of influencers. Obviously, there are, you know, the fashion one, the mom one, people who cook, people that are all of it, people who are, you know, entrepreneurs as influencers. I mean, there's just so many different types of people that all of us look up to. And so I do think that there's a lane for everyone. If you have a voice, if you are in some way feel like you're inspiring people, you should, you know, there, there's a reason why that, you know, they're asking you for advice or, you know, leaning into you for content and such. And so I just, I love that there's just so many more influencers that we can work with and again, achieving great results. And then also again, with the rise of, you know, other platforms, obviously in particular TikTok, it's even more exciting that like anyone in some capacity can really go viral and can take that and kind of parlay it into, you know, a whole new, you know, life. And so that's what I love about influencers is that, you know, you could just be the quote unquote regular person but just influencing people by just being yourself. And that's, to me, what an influencer is. Yes. Oh. All right, 2022, slow your roll. Q1, it flew by and it was such a different season for my business. I was on maternity leave. I announced my first book, How Are You Really? And my team and I kept the business running through another winter of uncertainty. How are you feeling after the start of the year? Are you ready to take on Q2 and really put your head down on strategies and systems for growth this year? Well, HubSpot is here to help you with an easy to use CRM platform that aligns your business and delivers a seamless experience for your customers. Other CRMs can be cobbled together, but HubSpot is carefully crafted in-house for businesses just like yours. Its purpose-built suite of operations, sales, and marketing tools work together seamlessly so that you and your team can focus on what really matters, your customers. With features like team email, you can turn incoming emails into tickets or send them straight into your shared inbox so no more questions can slip through the cracks. You can even take your business to go with the HubSpot mobile app. Learn how to grow better by connecting your people, your customers, and your business at HubSpot.com. I can't believe I'm saying these words, but I wrote a book. I keep thinking that the more that I say it, the more real it's going to feel, but it's truly been this surreal experience working on this massive project, especially since I said I would never do this. Never say never, right? Well, there's this amazing story behind the book, how it all came together with the encouragement of a massage therapist and seeing a mouse and how I managed to write my heart out in secrecy over the last few years. My first book is called How Are You Really? And I would love to share all of the behind the scenes with you before it's out this summer. I sincerely hope you'll join me inside of my Insiders Club so that you can take this book writing and launching journey alongside of me. You can join right now at jennacutcher.com slash book. That's jennacutcher.com slash book for the insider scoop about how are you really. I can't wait to share this book and this journey with you. I'll see you on the inside, gold diggers. I love that. And I think, you know, it's like we almost forget so often now. I saw this amazing quote the other day and it was like, 
if you want to be a big deal, start with your community first and then branch out to the world. And it's almost like we've gotten it backwards these days where it's like, I want to speak to the masses. And when I have a platform, then I'll start speaking about the things that matter to me. And it's like, wait, 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 we got to start with where we're at. And if you're impacting, you know, five people, that's a massive thing. And a lot of times I'll tell people, you know, let's say you have 3000 followers. I'm like, Google a stadium with 3000 people in it. Imagine standing on a stage and like how impactful that is. And now speak like it matters. And, you know, I think that with the whole influencer culture in the world, like it, we get it wrong. We get it wrong so many times. And I love that revolve. And I love that you are focusing on people that not only move the needle, but have that influence and have earned that influence with any amount of people. I think that's so beautiful. Yeah. And I mean, I think, you know, how I always, you know, how I view influencers again in a diff when you think about it with your marketing kind of hat on is you know, somebody with like 3000 followers and someone with, you know, 3 million followers at the end of the day, they're speaking to somebody, they are a billboard for a brand like Revolve or whoever that, you know, they want to represent, like that's still, you know, someone. And so for me, an influencers channel is just that, you know, if we're working with 4000 influencers, it's to me, 4000 billboards that you can have. And that's, virtually impossible for any company to have, but that's what influencers can do for your business. And so that's, again, how when I think about it in the business way, and not just like, of course, on a level of a person who's influencing, that is how I I really view it as like, these are just billboards that you are putting up about your business. And if somebody is wants to, you know, like take that microphone and talk about your brand, like, that's amazing. Like, that means that they are willing to like, be your billboard, which I think is like very powerful in itself. And knowing that like you have brand alignment, I think is just, it's amazing and powerful. Tell me about, so we've heard the story of the first photo shoot and the pitch that led to it. How has Revolve's influencer marketing strategy evolved over time? I mean, I think there's so, <laughs> I mean, I, I know we don't have that much time, but uh, it's, it's, it's evolved in the sense that it's gotten more granular and just, of course, bigger yeah. and more, just a little bit more sophisticated. You know, I think in the beginning, you know, again, a decade ago, it was like, okay, let's do these trips and, you know, let's just make sure that, you know, it's fun and we're connecting with people. So in some ways it's still the same. Cause I think ultimately, like, I always want people to feel like the brand is aspirational, that it's fun. And that I want you to think about Revolve when you want to you know, live your best life, whatever that means, whether it's, you know, working out and you get your, you know, aloes set on Revolve or, you know, you're going to your bachelorette party. But like behind, you know, the curtains, it's, you know, building the team, you know, making sure that you have the right people to lead these, you know, various kind of initiatives that we're, we're doing. You know, the trips obviously have evolved to become much larger where, you know, before it would be two to four people. And then sometimes we would have now like, you know, 80 people on a trip. Like it's, it's really just like nuts. And then, you know, of course we sprinkled in a lot of like our tent pole events, Revolve Festival is coming up. And then we have something really special that we're opening in a couple of weeks in Los Angeles. And so again, as much as like it's evolved in terms of just you know, how sophisticated it's been, obviously all the data that we're collecting to make sure that we have, you know, kind of the right, not just the right influencers, but like, are these marketing, you know, tactics that we're doing, you know, really resonating and penetrating to the people that we want to speak to, you know, that's obviously has evolved, but ultimately my goal always, again, is to connect with our community, with our consumers, to get new customers and to make sure people think about us when they want to live their best life. Mm. I think that's so powerful. Is that how you think about Revolve, hopefully? <laughs> yes. Well, I was just going to say, when we were on the group call that we were on, everyone was like, I unsubscribe from so many brands' emails and Revolves are the emails that I want to open. Give us any strategy or any things that you think about because it's so much more than just buy this shirt or buy these pants. Tell me a little bit about the strategy there and how you leverage that. Yeah. I mean, one, obviously, again, it takes like a whole village to identify, you know, all of these things to make sure that, you know, we have the right merchandise. That's like, you know, I think we have the best buying team. Like they really go out there and, you know, scour the world, honestly, for like, you know, a 
an Australian brand that people may have never heard of, but, you know, are now on Revolve. And I think that's one like massive thing that has been so uh, beneficial and essential to our marketing is that, you know, people actually want to wear it, (laughs) you know? And so I think in terms of like being an entrepreneur and and starting, you know, uh, your business and thinking about influencer marketing, it's like, one, like, do you have a great product? Like, I think as much, you can market to whoever you can have, you know, Kendall Jenner wearing it or whoever, ultimately you need to make sure that the product is great. Like it just needs to be. And then second, after you've identified that, I think it's figuring out who is very excited about this product. Like who's going to really like want to wear it and like, you know, or drink it or like, you know, just be a part of it. Who would be excited to come to our events and who would be excited to potentially post about this? I think a lot of brands probably don't think about that. Like the, I, I know it's an overused word, but the authenticity part is so essential because the more you have people that really, really, really want to be a part of it, the more, you know, everything feels just better, (laughs) you know, like you have a perfect match. And that's what we're trying to always do is like, find a perfect match, you know, who's the influencer that's like, you know, again, has those kind of attributes of like, having fun and like works hard, like lives her life. Like, these are, you know, things that we always think about. And I think for brands, that's, you know, however small or big you are, those are essentials. And, you know, of course, like you want to dress or give, you know, work with so many influencers, but ultimately it's kind of like dialing back, especially in the beginning and maybe writing 10 people that you're like, you know what, these are the people that represent my brand. And and again, do the exercise of what, if you were to pitch your brand with three to five words, what words would those be? And then make sure that when you think about these people that you want to work with, they fill those buckets. Like that's very, very important. And I think, again, the more you have those authentic connections, the easier it is to really get to the people that would want to buy your product. Yes. I think that's so smart. And it's very strategic in a way that doesn't feel limiting. It almost feels empowering. It's like you have these pillars of your brand and Absolutely. they don't exactly. have to speak to every single person every single time, but bits and pieces of those pillars are going to resonate with people differently. And I think it also gives people and brands permission to be multifaceted and not back yourself in a corner. Do you agree? For sure. I mean, I th- y- yes and no. I think like you made a good point. Like sometimes, you know, I, I get overly like stressed about like, you know, before, I think this was before, like being the brand for all. Yeah. And I think like every brand wants to be for all, but I think it's also very, very challenging to be a brand for all. I think when a brand for all is like an Amazon, yeah. a Nike, you know, even like, you know, Coke. <laughs> and I mean, it's, at this point, Coca-Cola is not a brand for all, but you know, it's different ages, all of these things. And I think like, we get pigeonholed in that that's how we grow a business. But in actuality, I think sometimes, you know, to have a successful business is to really know who your consumer is and being okay that like, this is not going to be for someone who's maybe, you know, 75 or someone who's seven years old. I think in some ways, again, like for Revolve, the success has been being hyper-focused on a consumer. And again, these brand words that we use. And one of those words that I actually haven't mentioned aside from, you know, fun and, you know, living aspirational, living your best life is the word young. I think people associate young with age, but I don't look at it like that. I look at young as a feeling. When you Mm -hmm. feel like you're young and energized, you could be 75. You know, my mom like buys stuff from Revolve and, you know, she's almost 70 and she loves, you know, you know, certain brands and obviously some of like the beauty products and such. But I love that word, not because again, it's ageist, but it's a feeling that you have. I mean, I'm turning 40 this year and I still feel like, again, I feel young in the sense that I'm like, you know, I'm energized and I, I, I'm excited about life. And I think that that's not a age thing, but a feeling and energy that I, again, I want people to associate our brand with. Mm, I love that. I love that. My grandma always says, you're only as old as you feel. So (laughs) totally. It's true. 22 today. (laughs) I know. I mean, Jenna, I'm just kind of like trying to live with this big 40 this year, but you know what? I think, I think I'm, I'm, I'm finally settling into it. You know, like I, I've been doing so much like reflecting and, you know, have even being on this podcast, like, thank you for such great questions has made me like 
continue to reflect on my career and just this journey. And, and it's been so fun. Like, it's so fun to me. And that's, I think, one other kind of, I don't know if you're asking or the people want to hear, but just like, it should be fun, you know, generally something that you start as an entrepreneur or maybe a career that you're really building. Like, of course, there's going to be days that, you know, it's hard and it's very, very stressful, but ultimately it should not, you know, outweigh like how much fun you have when you wake up and like, you're like, I'm going to just do this. And like, I love it. 10 meetings. Let's go. You know, <laughs> like, And funny enough, like, it's weird. I feel like that still like doing this for so long. And I still feel like we have so much to do. Like there's so much yeah. like I, and I think that that's like a, again, that, that feeling of young and energy is, or energize is it's, it's so electric. And, and I'm so happy that I still feel this way. Oh, I love that. And I agree too. I I mean, there are days that feel like you're in the muck, but there should be more days that feel exciting and that get you out of bed and that make you feel electric. And I love that. I think it's so important. And I think <laughs> when we really trace back our paths, it's like, this is why we started this in the first place. This is why we totally. pursued this and we forget that excitement. I remember when I used to be a photographer, when I was learning photography, I would literally sleep with my camera on my nightstand and wake up and challenge myself to like take a picture no matter what the lighting was in my bedroom. And I was like, I want that level of excitement, whether it's writing a book or coming on this podcast, like I want that nightstand passion in my life. And I think we can forget that. And we have to remind ourselves of that. Like, remember what it felt like to feel that again. For sure. I love that. I mean, I think you you really summarized it as like, okay, like kind of thinking back to those moments of how you started and then hopefully, you know, embodying some of that still. And I think, you know, like we both said, it's so, so important because it gets so hard and it's like so stressful and the stakes get bigger and there's more pressure and, you know, et cetera. All of those things will happen, especially as people, you know, achieve more success or find themselves like in a bind. But at the end of the day, again, if you're, you know, kind of keep your head down for a little bit and just and come up for air when you need to, I think hard work does kind of pay off. It will. So yeah, I couldn't agree with you more. So I want to know if somebody is listening to this episode and they have a business and their business could benefit from having influencers what do they do? What is the first step? Do you have like a best practices playbook for entrepreneurs that want to leverage the power of influencer marketing in their own business? I mean, I do. I think, you know, kind of what I mentioned a couple of minutes ago is like really just making sure you know what you're trying to be, you know? And I know that sounds like a very easy thing, but I, again, I think it's hard when there's so many brands and companies out there that it's, easy to kind of not be in your lane and stay in your lane because you're so focused on what other people are doing. So I think, you know, starting with those brand words and just kind of, again, what is your, just, what is your elevator pitch? If you had to just give it about what you're doing and what your brand is about. And then, you know, not overwhelm yourself with like, you know, a gazillion influencers. It's, it's hard, especially when you're starting out and it's probably just you and potentially like, you know, one other person doing everything. It's kind of taking things, you know, one step at a time and identifying those people that again, you think is most, you know, appropriate and will be cheerleaders for you who will be your billboard will pick up that mic and talk about a new launch. We'll pick up that mic and, you know, talk about, you know, a launch of your new website. Like those are the people that you need to make as allies. And I think having those people, even if they have 3000 followers is really, really essential. And then beyond that, of course, it's like thinking about the platform. I mean, again, it's very, you know, hard now because we're so hyper-focused on Instagram, but maybe your brand is more conducive to a, you know, a TikTok or even like, are you targeting younger consumers and you need to be on Snapchat and like, you know, direct messaging with them there. You know, I feel like we have to really expand beyond kind of like what we know. And that's a challenge for me and for Revolve at this point is like, we've built a business on Instagram, but now it's like, I feel like we're late on everything, you know? And so that's like my rush. And that's, I know feels very, um, probably feels a little bit of pressure for, again, the young 
you know, entrepreneurs out there that are starting out that may just be by themselves. But it is that, you know, taking a pause and just saying, okay, what is my brand about? If it's a beauty product, like maybe you should be on TikTok and not even on Instagram because you can maybe show a before and after and that's going to go viral on TikTok, which I've seen a million times with a beauty product, you know, like what is that three second pitch? And that's the thing you have three seconds to like, you know, get someone's attention, whether it's on a photo or a video. So I think just getting to know what your brand stands for and figuring out where your consumer is. And then of course, with influencers, you know, how can you use them as your cheerleader, as your ally? They are out there. And if they love your product, they will absolutely do that for you. And then my last thing I would say on the influencer side is I know people ask me too, like, well, you know, I don't have a budget and I don't have this and which... Of course, I went again when Revolve started. We had like no budget. We didn't even have a marketing team, to be honest, and never, you know, obviously figured out how to do it ultimately. But I would say, you know, get creative, you know, with what you first, of course, tell them that you're a small business, etc. But if you're seeing some traction, like maybe that's somebody that you want to, you know, maybe give a tiny piece of the pie to. I'm not saying like go out there, but saying like, hey, maybe if you sell this, we can give you X amount of commission. Like, Take control of those relationships, own those relationships and continue to make them your ally. Because again, you know, that's what's going to keep them talking about you like and posting about you on, on whatever platforms you choose. I think maybe gone are the days where everything is, you know, 100% free. But I do think it's still out there. And I do think a lot of influencers are now so savvy about, you know, how they can get paid. So get creative and don't be afraid to have those conversations. Ugh. This was so amazing. I feel like this is a masterclass and an inspirational speech on how we can do this and get started and kind of go back to the grassroots and not be afraid to do that. I think that it, this has been a really beautiful permission granting episode. And I'm just so grateful for you coming on. Where can everybody find out more about you and Revolve and all the places? Give us everywhere to go. Oh my gosh. Okay. Well, obviously at Revolve for our Instagram, revolve.com um, for shopping and just kind of cute everything. We also have a sister site called Forward. It's fwrd.com. It's more kind of luxury brands that are on there and honestly very dangerous. And then I'm just on, you know, I'm on Instagram. It's Raisa Girona on Instagram. And I'm sure it'll be on the I know my, my name is challenging, but I'm sure Jen and the team will put it on the episode. But this was so, so fun. And again, such a great, you know, today's my daughter's birthday. I think I told you this. I've been reflecting so much. And I, I just talking to you today has really kind of put, you know, icing on that in terms of, you know, this journey and like how I've also been able to, you know, kind of figure out motherhood while well, trying to figure out influencer marketing and how to grow this business with Revolve has been, you know, it's been such a great day. So I'm, I'm, I'm so grateful. Thank you so much, Jenna. This conversation was so much fun. It has been such a blessing to be able to connect with women virtually over this last year. And when you find somebody that you just want to get to know, it's like, man, I want to harness up that energy and bring it to you. I'm so grateful for Risa for sharing her experience and her story and for giving us the permission to simply start, get creative, and start sharing the things that we love. Thank you so much for listening to another episode of the Gold Digger Podcast. Until next time, keep on digging your biggest goals. I'm over here giving you a virtual high five because you just finished another episode of the Gold Digger Podcast. Did that go by way too fast for anyone else? If you want more, head over to golddiggerpodcast.com for show notes and all the discount codes from today's sponsors. And if you're looking for a new crew of movers and shakers like you to bounce ideas and ask questions, be sure to join my exclusive community for gold diggers on Facebook. The link's waiting for you at golddiggerpodcast.com.